Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you very much for coming today. Uh, Giles and I are very happy to have the opportunity of discussing our FY19 results with you and uh, how the future looks. Uh, it's been a, a really pleasing year, uh, again, I'm, I'm pleased to say. Um, I think it's a year that a lot of people have focused on our transformational acquisition, which we made last August. But that's definitely not the whole story. We've had very pleasing organic growth in the year. And Giles will uh, delve into uh, where that's happened and why that's happened. Um, it's a year where we've once again seen the benefits of uh, recent investments, fast payback investments, where we see new opportunities to become increasingly efficient. And there are more opportunities to come, which is exciting for us. Product innovation has absolutely played its part. Um, it's quite interesting. We now employ 220 full-time designers around the world. Our design studios are our engine room. Innovation is key. Our customers expect innovation from us, and I believe we're not disappointing them, and we take it incredibly seriously. We acquired Impact at the end of August. We've really hit the ground running with Impact. We'll give some detail on that later, but uh, in short, the uh, operational synergies that we highlighted that we would deliver, we are absolutely on track uh, and are doing that. We're, we're very happy with that. And put all those things together, and it's uh, helped us to deliver record sales, profit, earnings per share, and also, pleasingly, dividends, having generated uh, very significant uh, cash during the year. So a very pleasing year. If I went back 15 months and said, well, that's what the outcome would be, uh, well, we're very happy with that outcome. So we're now very much focused on the, on the future. On to slide three, uh, just to give you a, a flavor of what our business uh, looks like in terms of uh, the balance of our business. As you can see, during the year, the United States was 53% of our sales, the UK 22%, Europe 15, Australia 8, and the rest of the world too. We expect the business in the United States to be in excess of 60% of our sales uh, this year. It's where the main growth opportunities are, but it's not the only area of growth. And again, we'll, we'll dig into that. You can see that the Christmas season was 56% of our sales, roughly similar to last year. But what is interesting for us is that what we call minor season sales, Valentine's Day, Easter, Mother's, etc., or more, let's say, specialist occasions like Super Bowl Sunday or Thanksgiving or St. Patrick's Day, um, that area is now over 20 million pounds of sales for the business and they are higher margin uh, categories. You know, we describe ourselves as a very customer focused business and we certainly don't apologize for that. We are very much asking what are the problems that our customers have? How can we provide solutions for those problems and in doing so create profitable opportunities? We're very aligned with our customers and we're very proactive in, uh, in working closely with them. And one of our key strategic drivers, as we'll describe later, working with the winners. We really are working with the winners and the question is who are going to be the winners of the future and who won't be. I think slide four captures what our three key commitments are to shareholders. First of all, to deliver double digit earnings per share growth. We're very happy that in the year that's been 33%. Over the last five years, that's averaged at 28%. Generating cash, a pretty healthy thing for any business to do. But during the year where we part funded the acquisition of Impact Innovations, with cash, we've once again reduced average leverage from 1.5 times to 1.3 times. And as you may have seen, market consensus is, and we're comfortable with that, that we will continue to do so this year. And finally, um, dividend up 42% in the year, very much underpinned by record levels of cash generation. We have said that we will have a progressive dividend policy last year 3.6 times cover, this year 
3.4 times cover, and we see that progressing to 2.5 times. Um, the other day when we put together this presentation, Giles and I quite kind of paused for breath for just a little while and said, that's a pretty interesting trend. If we go back three years, I remember being asked the question, well, uh, the business has really progressed well. Have you peaked? Well, since that time, um, EPS growth has doubled. Leverage, average leverage has more than halved and dividends have trebled. I guess to continue progress on a sort of, you know, a higher platform is challenging but we see lots of areas that we can continue to grow and improve on. As I've said previously, we're happy with the result, but it's not a perfect result. And all the planets have not aligned perfectly. We've had our challenges in the year and we've got our opportunities going forward. So to give you some uh, greater granularity and insight into uh, what's been keeping us busy, over to Giles. We've basically delivered that EPS growth through both revenue growth and also margin growth. And you can see that on the slide where uh, revenues were up 37%. And I'll give you a little bit more insight into that in a minute. Um, our adjusted profit was up 39%. And also we ended the year with 17.1 million pounds worth of cash, which was 12.7 million pounds more than the previous year. So all in all, good headline numbers. If we turn the page though, we can see some more detail around that. In terms of revenues, it was not just about the acquisition. We also delivered 9.8% organic growth um, across the group. So we had growth in every region, both not only in revenues, but also in profit. Our adjusted operating margin went forward 20 bips to 7.3%, an area of focus for every business unit that we have. But an interesting dynamic behind it, when you look at the playoff between gross margin and also overheads. And what we saw as a result of the acquisition of impact um, was our gross margin dropped, um, but our overheads as a percentage of sales dropped more, hence driving that um, increase in operating margin. And why was that the case? Impact, we knew this when we bought it, was a business that had a lower gross margin, but had incredibly good costs to serve low cost of service, an efficient business. And so all we're seeing in this, this, this consolidated picture is the uh, weighted effect of that in the year. The good news is that 7.3% is an area of focus, as I say, and we continue to expect to see that go up next year and beyond into the future years. So uh, more opportunity to come. Just in terms of some of the uh, more mundane, I suppose, tax, we love tax. Um, tax rates came down, and I think that we signalled this uh, even last year by saying, uh, you know, the, the drop in the US federal tax rate uh, has driven uh, a lower uh, uh, overall effective tax rate for our business down at 23.4%. Um, going forward, it's going to be a similar level there or thereabouts. I think most people will have seen um, that the P&L does have uh, uh, an exceptional cost in there, 8.4 million pounds, so not insignificant, but really reflecting, overwhelmingly reflecting the uh, acquisition of impact, uh, not only the cost of acquisition, but also the US restructuring that's been going on thereafter. The good news is we are pretty much done in relation to uh, restructuring. And so we don't expect a similar, in fact, we'll, we, we will have some, but they're going to be a much lower level of exceptional cost going forward um, in the region of one, maybe slightly more, but one million pounds. So that's our performance in terms of P&L. If we look at it at a business unit level on the next page, I mean, we've, we can see a, a significant increase, uh, a 41% increase in the actual operating profit itself. And you can see that's coming from across the group. Um, so st standout areas, obviously, at the Americas business, um, significant, obviously, in the impact was where we was a, is an American acquisition. But actually underlying that, we've still got organic growth there of 10% um, in, in revenues. In the UK, the UK is a, a challenging market for the in, in retail at the moment. 
And we were really pleased just to, to see 3% growth, not in revenues, but also 3% growth in our uh, uh, profits as well. So a, a good result there. Europe, standout performance really in, in Europe as well, where we saw revenues increasing significantly, but also uh, our margins going further forward. Um, reflecting a number of aspects there. One, we, we are growing our, our sales in product areas where we have a higher gross margin. That's driving part of that margin improvement. But we're also seeing efficiencies coming through from our investment in the printing press that we have talked about before. We invested in a, a brand new uh, printing press in, into our Dutch business uh, last year, fully operational during the year, and we saw those efficiencies coming through, helping uh, improve the operating margin in, in that business. Australia saw a significant step forward in both revenue and also in terms of profitability. Main story there really being about the delivery of the operational synergies that we had identified in relation to the acquisition of Biscay, which we did the year before. But to balance that out, we are seeing some headwinds. The market, the market is a challenging market in, in Australia. So we are seeing some headwinds in Australia. Um, those will mean that we will see our revenues and our operating profit uh, step back in FY20. But the, the overall group, we will see that 7.3% operating margin grow um, and we will be delivering uh, in, improved profitability across the group as a whole. If we flick the page to the cash flow, then you'll see we have a headline 131% cash conversion. Um, fair to say, we always expected to get good cash conversion in the year because we knew when we bought Impact, we were buying Impact uh, at their peak working capital period. And so what we've seen is that working capital has been turned into cash as we anticipated, and that's very much uh, driving that uh, improvement and that high level of cash conversion. If we actually then look behind that at the underlying level of working capital in the business, then we have seen that increase and some of that is to do specifically with inventory. And it would be no surprise that our year end at the 31st of March is very similar to a certain timing of a, a certain exit from a, a bigger union. Um, and we did do some stock building in relation to that at the year end in our UK business. I'm trying not to say the B word. Um, and on top of that, we also uh, have built our inventory specifically in Holland in relation to the new printing press getting ready for production, which started in, in April. And that's now got, it's been produced. So it's, it's, uh, it's not like it's stuck there. Um, we've used that inventory and uh, really that's now uh, delivering some fantastic, even improved synergies again and efficiencies um, going into this year, into FY20 as well. So both are uh, uh, good moves. And then underlying that, we've also had growth in the business. Just on CapEx, we spent £7.9 million pounds in the year on CapEx, uh, a mixture of specific projects. Uh, biggest of those was converting equipment into, uh, into our Dutch business. We also had um, some paper bag production um, in the, into the UK, and also uh, uh, we invested in a new IT system in the US. All of these are fast payback uh, initiatives, and certainly we expect three to four years payback within, uh, from those, those investments. Going forward, we'll see uh, CapEx in FY20 increase um, to probably about 12 million. Um, and behind that, the big project is the new printing press that we're putting into uh, the US as part of our um, realization of the synergies that we um, identified when we did the acquisition. Um, and that uh, printing press will be delivered in November and go fully operational for our FY21 year. Um, if we flip the page to the balance sheet, uh, we have the delights of discussing IFRS 16. Um, I'll keep it short. Headline is um, obviously we are uh, capitalizing leases, um, we're, which will result in our EBITDA going up by about 6 million. It will also mean that our depreciation goes up by about 5 million. And there's the notional interest charge of about 2 million. 
So net impact on the P&L is actually a £1 million, up to a £1 million reduction in profit. Um, but to stress, no change in the actual cash that we're spending on leases. This is uh, pure accounting. But the other good news is we saw our return on capital employed improved to 24.3%, up from 225 in the previous year. Looking on the next page, we can... The year is quite a quiet, we've talked about it quite quietly, but actually quite a significant step for the company was we actually signed last week a new banking facility with uh, HSBC, but also with uh, four other banks. And the reason we did that was um, about 18 months ago when we were first got into a conversation with HSBC about, about our acquisition of impact, they clearly said to us, um, guys, you've been so successful, you've grown so much, we've started to reach a limit in terms of what we can lend as one single bank. We need you to go out and um, uh, get, uh, get some other banks involved so that we can put some, uh, some capacity into uh, your facility. So we've done that. Um, and I say we signed last week a, a new facility. It's a bigger facility. Um, it's at the same margin, so it's still very competitive. And uh, it's um, also got the potential to be a bigger facility because each of the individual banks is at a, at a level where they can grow with us. Um, and uh, so as we look to grow through either M&A or, or organic investment, then we've got the facility to do that in place now. Um, and that's a, a good position to be in. And finally, on the, the next page, we, we talk to, to, uh, uh, about our shareholder commitments, double digit growth in EPS, uh, leverage between one to two times and uh, uh, improving dividend uh, trend. But how do we get there? And how does that then link in with our strategic drivers? And this is um, our sort of trying to get a little bit more beneath the surface in terms of where, where, where do we focus our business and financially in terms of what we're trying to achieve. So we are looking to grow our revenues um, at up to 5% uh, per annum just organically. Because of those efficiency opportunities and the ability to move revenue into higher margin product, uh, we can see our EBITDA being, we're looking to see EBITDA go forward at 10%. And then operating cash conversion is still key to us, which will help drive both dividends, but also keeping our leverage at the right level. And we're looking to, to have operating uh, cash conversion at about 75% or more. And if we're doing all of this, our return on capital employed will continue to be at around that 24% level. And they are all, and behind all of those, we have specific actions that link back to the strategic drivers. Okay. So on to slide 14, and just to show that the strategic drivers are actually happening, they're real, we are walking the walk, not just talking the talk. Um, so the first one, working with the winners, what does that actually mean? And we just tried to capture this. On slide 14, you can see who the group's top 10 customers are. And without the effect of the impact acquisition, I think it captures the fact that we are working with the winners by telling you that we grew organically uh, with an average of 17% with those 10 customers around the world last year. And we're very happy with that. Those customers are growing stores, but they're also growing online. Or uh, in uh, some cases, they're actually going into new channels, such as convenience stores is one of the big growth areas in the UK market. Um, so we can grow by working with those customers by region, by channel, and across categories. And we are. It's happening. We're working with the winners. They want to work with the winners too. Um, the biggest growth channel for us, no surprise here, are the mass and discount sectors. It's 62% of our business now. Now, clearly, 38% of our business is in independence, or niche channels, and that's still an important area for us. But where's the growth going to come? We see that the discount and mass channels will, be, will continue to be big growth areas for us. And we're working very collaboratively with those retailers across many different projects and categories. So we're, we are living that strategy. Strategy two on slide 15, 
design and innovation. Last year, we created and sold over 50,000 new products around the world. And we've deployed our design capability to new categories. So uh, I, I know it will be on your radars mentioned before, a few years ago, we began to look at not for resale consumables, paper bags for the um, beauty and fashion industry. Not for resale consumables are now a 20 million pound revenue stream for us, about six million pounds in the United States, 14 million in the UK. The size of the market is Quite honestly, it's difficult to measure. It's growing at such a pace. The transition from plastic bags into paper bags is rapid. It's an exciting area for us. Our second production line comes on stream later this year, and we're already talking about our third production line uh, as well. Great area for growth. Similarly, in the creative play category, so this is colouring products and clays and doughs and uh, a lot of craft areas as well, it hardly existed for us a number of years ago. Uh, we see that as growing above $20 million uh, for us this year and growing outside the United States. So design and innovation is real and happening. For the first time this year, we have actually created an innovations hub for our business. We see innovations as a standalone discipline quite an interesting place to work where we've got talented people focused on new formats, on new substrates, on new materials. How do we deliver product to market? What does it look like in store? It's different to the design side, which is more aesthetic. This is really driving innovation across the group. And it's what our customers expect of us and we're, we're delivering. And finally, in terms of efficiency and scale, Yes, we continue to invest in the CapEx projects that uh, Giles alluded to. You know, the holy grail for us will be if we take the efficiency of our uh, printing in the UK and Holland, and we manage to achieve those levels in the United States, we can drive tremendous growth. And uh, we're on the case, very much on the case. Impact Innovations was the catalyst in the United States to make that happen. Clearly, m and is part of our strategy as well. Uh, we bought Impact and um, that has opened up new avenues of opportunity. A lot of the time that Giles and I are spending is looking at new m and opportunities. Most of them, frankly, don't make sense. But there are those which do. And we have to make sure that, uh, obviously, we don't get a case of indigestion, that uh, it, we're still pretty early in the cycle of, uh, what is it, 10 months on from buying impact. And we're very much on course, but let's keep our eye on that one. And we'll make sure that we resource um, new opportunities appropriately. We also have organic growth to take care of. It's a high class problem, uh, but uh, we're very conscious of the fact that um, you mustn't bite off more than you can chew. But we certainly have the balance sheet strength. We have the new facilities that uh, Giles explained. We have the appetite and we have the opportunity, but let's be very discerning. And I, I promise you, we, we will be. So talking about impact on slide 17, just an update, where are we in delivering the operational synergies? We said that there will be a run rate of $5 million um, by the end of FY21. And I'm happy to say that we are absolutely on course. We delivered half a million of uh, synergies in 2019. Uh, we are absolutely on course for a further uh, 2 million in 2020 and then up to 5 million in 2021. That last uh, uh, balance of uh, synergies very much underpinned by the investment in uh, the printing press that will actually go into uh, Memphis at the end of this calendar year. And we see it being up and running and operational by uh, April next year. Um, and I can uh, tell you that, uh, you know, overwhelmingly, 
the integration of uh, impact uh, has been smooth. I think the teams, I'll take my hat off to the teams uh, there, uh, they've managed this extremely well and we've got um, very good synergies coming through. What I haven't mentioned is the cross-selling synergies. I've only mentioned the operational synergies. Um, we're getting some early wins, maybe early, earlier than expected, because normally there's a two-year cycle for those to happen. But we've, we've already seen benefit, cross-selling benefit, not just in the United States, but outside the United States as well. So we're very pleased with that. Um, on slide 18, we capture some of the, let's say, higher profile and more obvious challenges. Uh, as again, uh, Giles alluded to, we feel that we are uh, relatively Brexit neutral. We're manufacturing for the UK market in the UK market. We're manufacturing for continental Europe in continental Europe. There's not a lot of cross-border trade there and we think that we are uh, well prepared for that. Perhaps the more higher profile and relevant um, headwind and challenge for us is the whole issue of US-China tariffs. So that came on the, uh, on the radar last September and we absorbed incremental cost in FY19 from tariffs. Um, but we have been proactive. We've been sourcing outside of China. Not all of our products are actually subject to tariffs in the United States. Clearly, we're negotiating with suppliers. We're negotiating with customers. You re-engineer product. You manage your mix. But always, uh, from a headwind, there can be tailwinds because we are engaged in a good dialogue with customers saying, you know, whether we are responsible for the tariffs, because the vast majority of the tariffs our customers will pay, we engage with them and say, how can we collaborate with you and uh, perhaps uh, enjoy further opportunities as a result of, of doing that. And uh, when you um, have the level of relationships that we have with our customers, you can have that kind of dialogue. One of the things uh, I would say that was particularly pleasing, good for the ego, but actually a big statement. We recently won the Walmart Supplier of the Year in our product categories. I think what that tells me is, you know, when you acquire a business, as I'm sure you're all, all aware, it's a distraction. When you integrate businesses, it's a distraction. From our customer's perspective, that was invisible. It was a seamless transition and transaction. We achieved tremendous levels of customer service. That really is what that award is all about. And it, because it's a pretty uh, high profile, prestigious award, the industry is aware of that. So not only does it help cement our relationship with Walmart, but it's also an opportunity outside of that. So again, hats off to the team there. Um, as far as the outlook for 2020 is concerned, we're in good shape. We have a good order book, uh, probably now in excess of 70% of our annual forecast. Most market consensus uh, is that we will be there or thereabouts at around 500 million of sales this year. So that'll be a nice milestone if we're able to deliver on that. But uh, market consensus is that we will continue to deliver that operating margin growth, as uh, Giles mentioned, uh, and we're in good shape to do so. Uh, certainly challenges ahead, but uh, the opportunities outweigh those challenges and, and um, you know, we, we feel good about the, the year going forward. So the last number of years has been a good journey. We see that top line will continue to grow organically. We will be looking at uh, M&A opportunities. As I said, we'll be very discerning, but we see the story of top line growth, bottom line growth, plenty of cash generation. We'll be investing in the business and continuing to improve return to shareholders. So that's our story and we, we uh, 
very happily <coughs> welcome any questions. Thank you very much. I've got uh, two questions. One on the financing facilities. Most of them are three years. Is that, uh, what's the rationale for having a three year? So, so typically what we have is a three year facility with the op option to yes. extend and at, with those options to extend, we can actually take it to five years. Um, I think it's a, I think it's pretty much market would be, you start with three um, with a, the opportunity to have an extension. So that's what we've got. So I don't think we're doing anything that's particularly outside of what other companies do. <coughs> How many banks was it? Five. So the banks Majors are... Majors or minors? Major banks or minors? Some you'll have heard of. So HSBC, uh, BNP, um, NatWest, uh, two maybe less, two are US banks. One's called SunTrust and the other one's called PNC. With the operations in the US, are you still using the impact name to carry that goodwill through? Or is this... So when you walk, you've got this award, is it an award to impact or is it an award to IG? What sort of... Actually, the award, the award was to Impact because Impact were the, was the supplier name at the beginning of the tra trading year. But we're now, um, the, the customer base sees um, us as one group. And uh, what we've been very careful to preserve is the product expertise, uh, but uh, we are increasingly presenting ourselves as one group with a uh, expertise in gift packaging and seasonal decor. So, um, and it helps to unify the, the businesses together. Can I ask you on your operating margin, what's your medium term aspiration? We'd hope, we, we're, medium term is, is 8%. Um, and, uh, you know, ultimately, we, if we can go higher, we will do. Um, but, uh, yeah, that's sort of where we're focused at the moment as a group. <coughs> Could I ask about the um, uh, concentration uh, risk within the, the firm? We've got 20% of revenues with Walmart. How, uh, what was that number prior to the impact acquisition? And, uh, and can you say anything about the nature of the relationship with sure. Walmart and how you deal with them, how many different departments? And has there been, been any change in the mood music since you acquired impact because sometimes it, you know a change of ownership is a catalyst for suppliers great to question review things. yeah um, so prior to acquiring impact our largest customer was around seven and a half percent of sales that was Costco so you know you're right it was a, a, a real shift when we acquired impact and frankly before we did so that was one of the questions that kind of spooked us. What does that look like? Because for impact, Walmart was over 60% of their sales. But um, when we understood the complexity that was being managed by impact, you know, well in excess of a thousand bespoke SKUs across seasons, departments, categories, buyers, brands, etc., and the track record that Impact had, because actually Impact has been supplier of the year, I think it's three or four times in the last 10 years. Uh, what we found is, you know, we had an excellent, as design group, we had an excellent relationship with Walmart, but um, Impact were hard to shift out of the categories they were in, which made them very appealing. But before uh, we actually acquired um, Impact, we went to Walmart and we asked um, what their perception was of what they would like to see from the two businesses coming together. And we advised, and this is exactly what we're doing, that we actually saw that we can accelerate investment in Impact. We can increase our US manufacturing capability and capacity. We can invest further in design and innovation. And it very much dovetails with Walmart's strategy, which is to consolidate their supplier base, work with the winners, as I mentioned before, as, as we are doing. 
and they felt that two plus two will make five from their perspective in terms of capability. What I'm pleased to say, and I guess it captures everything, is our, our collective business with Walmart will grow this year. And um, I think that our opportunity is also to take that Walmart expertise that Impact had and apply that magic pixie dust to other customer relationships. Uh, it's not a criticism, it's a statement of fact. Impact was pretty focused on Walmart. Yeah. It's a strength and a weakness. But we saw that uh, it's an opportunity for us to leverage our, our relationships. And that's genuinely what's been happening. With the gift items so, such as these, are you um, taking just the design and innovation fee and somebody's saying, I would like you to make a bag? I try to understand the basis of the business. You talk a lot about manufacturing for the wrapping yeah. paper and all that. But for all this other stuff, are you saying, we're going to make a pencil case and we'll ask Pixar after things, or, or did somebody come to you and say, we need some design to go with this? How does that work? No, we, we are the originators, originators of the product. We design it under our generic brands, under our customer brands, and under licensed brands. So you're looking at product here. Licensed brands for us this year will be around 9% of our sales. So the Disney portfolio, for example, um, in the United <coughs> States, we've got some... Uh, very successful brands with the sports franchises, you know, NFL and NBA and NHL, the hockey league is very popular over there. And it's part of our portfolio. We are the one-stop shop from a brand point of view as well as a category point of view. Uh, Australia has always been a challenging market for the company since uh, you know, for a number of years now. It's doing better this year than before, I think. How strategic is your presence in Australia now that you've got the American market opening up for you in terms of priority? How do you look at Australia? Is that a dare well, to stay or is it? It's a joint venture. That's the first thing we, we should say. Um, it's also the highest corporation tax regime where we, we trade. So, uh, you know, it's had a great result in FY19. We're really happy with it. We had a very successful. Uh, acquisition and the integration process has been excellent. But in pro rata to the overall group, is it really significant, particularly from an EPS perspective? No, but it's successful. It's relatively low maintenance. We've got a good team there. I think we're happy to have a joint venture there. It's a long way away. It's good to have a, 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 a partner where our in an interest that are absolutely aligned. And frankly, it's a, uh, an area where we can easily leverage the product development, development that happens around the group. So um, we see it as a, as a good market. As Giles uh, mentioned, we see some headwinds in Australia this year, but we see a profitable business. So we're, we're happy with it, but the growth undoubtedly is going to be in the United States. We do see growth in the UK. For us to achieve 3% top line and 3% bottom line in growth in the UK, sure, it's very modest compared to other areas, but we were really happy with that. The UK was a tough place, has been for a number of years. So uh, I think single digit growth, I think some of our competitors will give their right arms for that. And uh, we're very happy the team had to work incredibly hard to deliver that, but they delivered it. And we do see growth this year. And in the US, um, am I right in thinking some of the paper has actually been transported at the moment from Holland uh, over? Uh, uh, only in the short term, because clearly we have the same capability in the US uh, early next year. So, so does that mean then there's going to be spare capacity in Holland and how are you going to fill that? Well, we're growing, as you can see, significantly organically in Europe. Uh, and uh, we see the capacity is, this year is, is you know, very full. Okay. Is that what you mean by moving production to the US on page 18? Yeah. That's what you okay. So the rest of the world is trivial, but uh, maybe you don't have the bandwidth for it, but is there anything emerging from all of that? massive geographic slice that would be part of your future in any sort of next two or three years? Well, uh, if I say Asia, that's, that's a yeah. pretty big place. Uh, and uh, we're seeing growth in areas like Japan and Korea. Yeah. 
we're not seeing growth in China. I was actually uh, specifically thinking of Japan and Korea. Right. J- yeah, absolutely. And we're definitely seeing uh, uh, growth there. Um, India is interesting, but it tends to be partnering with uh, some you know, uh, European-based yeah. retailers over there. Um, but I don't see that as our easiest win in the short term, but longer term, I see us deploying more resource to that, definitely. As a follow-up to that then, how much of your management time is spent on M&A, looking at review, et cetera, versus the organic growth that you sort of played it against? Well, I think, I think you know, explaining the, the, the structure of the group. So we have regional CEOs, they're very focused on organic growth, but they also look at M&A opportunities. So Giles and I are our corporate office. I think it's 16 people. Giles and I are two of them. And certainly, uh, I would say half of our time is very much focused on uh, making sure that we're on track with day-to-day and we've, we've got very good visibility of that. But I would say now half of our time is spent on M&A. Some of that is actually triggered by our regional CEOs. Some of it isn't. But what I would say is if those CEOs aren't bought in to the M&A opportunity, it won't work. So we are very much working hand in hand with those CEOs. That's how it works. What's the capacity of one of these big printing presses? Um, and and um, how long will it take for the US press to be fully utilised? Well, I think the theory, there's theoretical capacity and actual capacity. Um, I would say that um, it would be three to four years before the full capacity is, is reached. The lead time on the kind of printing press that we're looking at from pressing the button to it being up and operational is probably around 16 to 17 months. So uh, for now, I think we'll have plenty of capacity. And what sort of revenue can, um, can that one printing press generate? Approximately $100 million. I can be more accurate, yeah. but... I, um, yeah, that's the sort of yeah. feels I wanted. Yeah. So it gives you plenty of organic growth opportunity. It does. Hopefully not enough, but we'll have to work on that. Yeah. Does everything come out of it then, like all the cardboard and paper-based? Well, for example, our, our printing press in, uh, in Wales, which was initially fully deployed on gift wrap, is now making uh, prints that we're converting into bags. So there are other categories that you can drive from that. And there's, I'll call them bells and whistles that we're putting onto the uh, press that just helps us add value and, um, and uh, create new categories all the time. Do you see any critical price or capacity problems with raw materials that you need? Obviously paper is a large part of it. Are there any aspects of that that are to be discussed? No critical issues. I mean, raw materials, we're seeing paper pricing. I mean, with this last couple of years, we've seen paper pricing increase quite substantially. Um, we're seeing that level off now. If anything, mm. you know, it may even start to go down. So it's, um, uh, we're not seeing the same pressures there that we saw before. Um, freight's pretty consistent, which is the next biggest uh, cost. So no, yeah, that, that was really the key issue. I don't yeah. understand. Yeah. For now, these yeah. things can change pretty yes. quickly, but we are pretty well covered for the next year. Okay. What is it in an M and A acquisition opportunity that you're looking for? Is it um, customer access to customers or um, different markets? If uh, if I think of those that are currently on the radar that are still of interest. I think most of this will be about uh, category expertise that we can um, exploit with our current customer base. Some of them are about different channels. Most of them is about products. Because 
if you're doing a good job for the major retailers, retailers are demanding, but they're pretty loyal. So to actually shift a competitor out of a product category is normally going to result from not particularly attractive margins. So um, we look for operational synergies, the sustainability of those relationships and uh, revenues, and um, often, certainly with some US um, opportunities that we're looking at, these businesses are incredibly focused only on the US. So if we can actually leverage that outside the US, which certainly with impact we can, that makes it also attractive. We'll also say to ourselves, what can the acquisition do that um, our organic um, business can't do? And it's normally a question of it's faster, uh, it's more profitable, and obviously you have synergy opportunities there. So, you know, as we've said, we can grow without M&A, but um, we can grow faster with the right M&A, and I'll emphasise the right M&A. And presumably you're seeing a lot more opportunities come to you. Yes, yeah. we are. Definitely. Um, not necessarily of quality, but a lot more. Certainly quantity, not necessarily quality. Uh, but yeah, definitely more. Part of that is just what's happening in the market. Secondly, people see us as a consolidator. And I think thirdly, just the scale of the uh, acquisition last August has just uh, definitely increased awareness, which is good. You talked earlier about the holy grails to get the US margins up to the margins you're achieving in the UK. Could you just give an idea of what the differential is and which margins you're talking about? I'm talking about margins in manufacturing of, of gift packaging. So this is in the gross margin as opposed to the net margin? Yes. Yeah. Um, and uh, if we apply it to what you know Bruce was saying, if we produced $100 million of uh, a gift wrap in the United States, at the levels that of, uh, of uh, margin and efficiency that we're getting in the UK and in Holland, then I would expect our, our margins to be roughly 5% more than they currently are in that activity in the United States. So pretty tasty. Do you have an uh, expectation with efficiency growing, but also the business growing, uh, do you see a substantial need for taking on more staff and are there any critical problems in acquiring the staff you need? I think particularly in the design and innovation area that is a competitive space. I, I, we, we will, as we grow, we will need to su support our, particularly our design teams. Yeah. Um, are we experiencing challenges in growing our design? I don't think we are. Okay. Um, and if anything, I think we're, you know, we're seen as a good place for people to come and work. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a challenging environment, but it's, there's always something new and it's so it's a, from a designer's perspective i think it's quite an interesting environment to work in so but <coughs> design's not the area but where we have recently invested is for the first time uh we have a global sourcing director so uh you know if we are we're spending around about 300 million dollars with our suppliers across asia uh working with over 100 suppliers We've got 100 people engaged in quality control and quality assurance. We've got uh, five different offices throughout the Far East. So leveraging scale, but applying common standards, trying to have one cohesive team is easier said than done. And we've, we've uh, uh, recently, uh, Keith joined us in January, um, have uh, an individual that we brought in very experienced in that area. He'll help us raise the bar in that area. I think that's a smart move. And um, the other area was in IT. We uh, have employed an excellent uh, guy in, uh, in the United States in the uh, IT area, which we just had a lot more opportunity to be more efficient. So... I agree with Giles, it's not going to be in the 
a design area where it's going to be challenging. We've got a great team. We've got to keep that team fresh and motivated and challenged, but it's in the other disciplines of our business. You know, if we can save through that efficiency 1%, uh, which I don't think is over ambitious, it's quite a lot of money and we'll, we'll take it. But we have to be organised differently to do that. Value-wise, where, where are the biggest organic growth opportunities, would you say, for this year or the next year? Geographically, it's the US. Um, and I suspect we'll continue to see organic growth in, in Europe as well, although it would just be at a smaller scale. But the US is, is by far the biggest. Um, and it's, that's just a, a function of scale. Um, in terms of, you know, the, the market there is just so much, so much bigger than it's here. Well, from a product category, you know, we can grow across uh, all categories. I think in value terms, uh, I think some of the biggest rates of growth will come in our um, creative play and giftware areas. We also think that the seasonal decor part of the impact business can show good growth uh, across the group. Um, but genuinely, we don't really see any areas going backwards. Yeah. And in terms of like the not for retail and the, the gift, or sorry, creative play areas, which have come from nothing in a few years, I mean, what's the potential of those in terms of what's the overall size of the market or is there a new market you're creating? I'm just. Well, not for retail, as I said before, and I'm not being flippant, it's just the truth. We can't even measure how big the market is now, it's just grown so quickly. Mm. But um, you know, we see every possibility to, to grow that part of our business significantly over the next few years. From a creative play uh, perspective, um, again, I'd be disappointed if that couldn't double over the next two to three years. In terms of headroom for acquisitions, um, with the facilities that have been arranged and, um, and other well, yeah, those facilities. Um, how, what is the headroom? And what would you be prepared to go to um, in terms of leveraging the business? So I think in terms of headroom, um, the, so within the facility, we have an accordion. So we've arranged for an accordion. That accordion is 140 million. Yeah. So that's quite a lot of facility headroom, yeah. um, should we need it. Um, so. That's the simple answer there. In terms of what but you need, quite a lot of that for working capital purposes. We'd need some. We'd, we'd need some. I mean, it all depends on until you get into an acquisition and you know what are you paying, what's the balance between equity and debt, and and so on. That you, these questions are sort of a bit academic and they're difficult to answer. Um, do we, when we looked at it and modelled what what we went for, we felt that that was the right um, level of accordion to have to do some pretty uh, good transactions and maintain leverage at about the 1 to 1.3 to 1.5 times. So clearly if we're buying a business then we're buying EBITDA we can bring we can bring uh, you know the bring it will be more debt but that the leverage would be uh, at the same sort of level. HSBC has been a sort of a strong supporter mm -hmm. of the group throughout its history. Uh, <clears throat> they, I mean, uh, they are part of the club facility yes, as well. Yep. Did they, did they, uh, front, did they, were the, the book runner? Effectively, yes. It wasn't quite run like that, but they were. They're the agent, they're, they're the um, bank. They're pretty much, and they are the biggest bank as well in the in the in the uh, sort of syndicate. Yeah. There isn't any reduction in their commitment, is there, in terms of the overall commitment? From HSBC, yeah. they did reduce. They did. Now, they reduced reluctantly no, because they recognised that if we're going to have to attract other banks in, they're going to have to reduce because they were doing it all before. It was a tactical rather than a... It, going forward, yeah. they want to increase. Okay, great. Thanks for the questions and for your interest. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.